And it's all for your glory and it's all for your honor. In Jesus' name. And everybody said a good amen. It's my honor today to bring to you our final professor in residence, a leader in residence. You guys know that we have this leader in residence program um, that the, the heart of it is, is that I always want the people who actually do it the best to be in front of you. So you can hire professors, and I think our professors and the people who teach you are great. But I, I, I always wanted to bring in front of you those who do, do it at the highest level and the best level. There is no person on planet Earth today that has trained and impacted more leaders than the person you're, no one on the planet. And that's not my opinion. I mean, like Inc. Magazine for 10 years has said that John Maxwell is the number one leadership guru in the world. Like, so you're getting ready to hear from the number one leadership guru in the world. Written 100 books, sold over 35 million copies. How many of y'all know that's about 34.9999 then all of us have sold, right, everybody? <laughs> I know. And just the honor of having someone. So like you always do, I want you to respond. I want you to take, everybody take notes, everybody. If, you're, if the person next to you is not taking notes, you point them out to me. No, don't do it. Just but let me know. Everybody take notes today. We're going to grow and learn. Can you help me honor like never before our guest today? Come on, Dr. John C. Maxwell. Yeah. You, love you, love you. So stay standing. So stay standing. Uh, before he speaks, I have a surprise for him. I want to. I want to give him this in front of all of you. He doesn't know I'm going to do this. Um, he asks for nothing. So he comes on his own dollar, and he just he asks for nothing. In fact, he is one of the top donors to to, to Highlands College. So, so I was thinking of a way, I still want to, I still want to bless him, but he won't take it. So John, we have a, we have a surprise for you today that in yours and Margaret's name, there's a fully endowed scholarship at worth of $150,000 has been given in your name. And we wanted to present this to you. So he's already got a bunch of scholarships. You have one more. Wow. You may be seated. Stalling to get my composure. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chris, for that beautiful gift. And uh, it's good to be with you. This, this may be the quietest chapel you've ever been in. <laughs> <coughs> um, so good to be with you. I'm so honored. And um, Margaret and I have had the privilege of investing in this incredible work of God. And uh, the only difference between before the chapel and now is that... Uh, our investment has to increase. Has to, it has to get more. Because you you got to be here to see it and you got to feel it. Um, and you're worthy of, of the investment. So we'll keep doing our best to serve you and give to you. And 
I wish you knew how much uh, PC loves you. He just, um, he adores you. He, lo- he loves being the chancellor. He just, he loves Mark. He loves everything about you. And when we're together, he just keeps talking about you. I tell him to shut up. And <laughs> give me a break. And, and he does for two minutes. You know, he, 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 this, is, this is his life right here. This is the reason we, we've been friends for many, many years and do a lot of incredible work together. But, but, but when we decided to join up to, to do, help raise money for Highlands College, it, you know, it, he, the whole catalyst was he said, this is my passion. And Chris, I, today I really understand. Um, I mean, I always understood But today I understand. There's no place like this place. Anywhere near this place. So this must be the place. (laughs) So I'm going to do my best. Um, You've just filled me. I've just, the worship was huge. I just wanted to keep on doing the worship. (laughs) Honestly, I wasn't too excited about hearing me. I just kind of wanted to, and I've been on a, I'm on a heavy trip. I, the day after Thanksgiving, I left for Italy and spoke at the largest leadership conference in Europe, the largest theater in, in Milan, Italy, and 10,000 leaders, and then went to Costa Rica, and did some major equipped transformation stuff, came here. I literally leave here in the morning and do a, go to Hawaii to speak for a company, and, and it's a 48-hour turnaround, and then I go, I, I, I just added up yesterday that, in, the, in 16 days, I, I spent 52 hours on a plane. And so, you know, it's a good thing I'm young. <laughs> I could handle this, you know. Somebody asked me, they said, how can you keep your pace? I said, oh, that's very simple. High energy, low IQ. <laughs> if, if you didn't have high energy, you, 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 you wouldn't do it, huh? And, and if you didn't, if you didn't, if you had a high IQ, you wouldn't do it either. You know what I'm saying? So it, I've got that perfect combination. So let me help you. Let me do my best to just serve you for a few minutes. Let me just talk to you. Um, simple lesson. Uh, lessons I wish I would have learned in college. Because I'm asked all the time. People say, "Well, you know, when you if, when you were in college, or when you were 20 or 25, would, you know, what do you wish you would have known then that you know now?" In fact, I, um, I have three degrees, and I have a doctorate in sem- out of seminary, and um, I was pastoring for 25 years, and after I graduated with three different degrees, I came to the conclusion that outside, of course, the spiritual area of, of a person's life, I came to the conclusion that there were four things that seminary never taught me, ne- never learned, and, and they were the four things I needed to to be successful in ministry. Again, outside of the spiritual faith component, obviously. And those four things were relationships, the ability to get along with people, equipping the ability to train and develop other people, attitude, the the thought life of how how to have an attitude that becomes an asset in your life to help you overcome adversity, and leadership, how to how to influence, how to lead others. So I called that REAL, R-E-A-L, Relationships, Equipping Attitude and Leadership. And for three years, I traveled the country doing a seminar, a seminar entitled Four Things Seminary Never Taught Me. And it became incredibly, incredibly popular. In fact, it was catalytic for me in writing books. Most of the books that you read of mine are either in Relationships, Equipping Attitude or, or Leadership because that was so important for me, and yet I never got it in college or in, in, in seminary. So that kind of triggered me. I wanted to use that as an introduction. And so, by the way, what I, here, let me just explain something to you. At Highlands College, you get all four. In other words, you're getting already what I never got in all the years of college, seminary. You're, you're getting it now. Do you, do you understand you do. I know you do. That, that, that wasn't a fair question because I know you. You do understand 
how fortunate you are to be a part of Highlands College. You, you understand that. You, you, you've got that. You're, you're getting things other students are not getting. You're in an environment that other students are not in. You're seeing people that other colleges just don't get the privilege. You're, you're in an environment and having experiences that others just, just aren't part of. So, the things I'm going to give you are very simple, and you can do every one of these. these. These are not out of your reach, but I wish I would have known them when I was your age. I wish I, if I would have had them in the beginning of my ministry, I surely could have done a lot better. So look at your neighbor and just say, you can do these things. Go ahead and tell them that. In fact, let's have some fun. Look at your neighbor and say, even you can do these things. Okay. They're not in any order of priority. I'll just give you five of them. Number one, grow every day. Make it your incredible passion to every day. Grow, learn, improve your life. Again, my life was changed in my mid-20s when I had a mentor ask me what my plan for growth was, and I had no plan. I graduated from college, and I think what happens is we come to college and we, we're, on a, we're on a growth plan. We go to classes, we have curriculum, we, there's a process there. And then when we graduate from college, I think there's a tendency for us to say, wow, hey, free at last. Thank God, I'm free at last. And, and then we begin to go to work. And, and a mentor of mine over breakfast one day asked me what my growth plan was. And I said, well, you know, I didn't have one. And he, and he told me those words that just absolutely the light came on for me. He said, well, John, he said, growth is not automatic. If you're going to grow, you have to be intentional. Now, getting older is automatic, but getting better is not. And so I, 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 in my mid-20s, I didn't get this in college. In my mid-20s, I, I just developed a passion to, to really grow in that passion today. If you would ask me outside of the spiritual realm, what would be the catalyst for the success that whatever I've had, I would tell you without any question, I'm 74 today. And I promise you, every day I learn, every day I grow, every day I apply what I'm doing. And, and I, I'm still growing. And the difference between me and you is I've had 50 years of this. So I've expanded my growth capacity. It's like going to the gym. I, my growth capacity is ridiculous off the charts. I mean, it's just huge. And, and, I, and my capacity to learn, my, uh, to apply it, to, to assimilate it quickly, it, it's, it's, it's the greatest ever. And, and, it, you know, and I'm living in my best days ever. And it's all, it's all because I've, I've just made a commitment every day to just grow and, and develop my potential. I heard a... I heard a man named Earl Nightingale when I was probably 27 who said that if you'd spend one hour a day every day on, 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 on one subject, one hour a day every day on one subject for five years, you'd become an expert on that subject. And I had such a passion to learn leadership and be a good leader, and I, was, I had bought into everything rises and falls on leadership by that age. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend an hour a day every day. Studying leadership, practicing leadership, talking to leaders, asking questions, having leadership experiences. And, 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 and I started my five-year going to become an expert in leadership journey. And every day I, I, would, I would do that. And, 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 and I would ask myself again, now, how long will this take? How, how long will this take? Well, it's going to take five years. So it's, I, I'm starting to be like Cape Canaveral, five, four, three and, I, and I'm in my countdown mode and, you know, okay, five years, you know, I'm, I'm getting there, I'm getting there, I'm getting there. But about halfway in my five-year journey, something beautiful happened within my life. I, I began to change on the inside. And all the things I was doing and learning about leadership was beginning to now take form within me. And I was beginning to lead better. And I was beginning to see leadership influence grow in my life. And, and I was beginning to see that that what I was learning was beginning to change me. And so all of a sudden I quit asking the question, how long will it take, how long will it take, how long will it take, you know, five, four, three. I quit asking the question, how long will it take? And I started asking the question, how far can I go? How far can I go? 
And I've been asking that question now for almost 50 years. And I haven't found the answer yet. I haven't found it. I, I'm still asking, how far can I go? I'm 74, and, and I'm asking, how, how far can I go? And I've discovered that there's no finish line. That, that, that I just keep learning and everything keeps growing and expanding because I've had a commitment to, a commitment to just absolutely intentionally every day grow my life. I want that for you. This is, a, this is the beginning. This is, this is where you get into the habit of growing and learning. But what you do is when you graduate, you don't want to stop the habit. You, you're, not growing, you're, you're, you're not growing for a degree. You're growing for significance. So, so understand the, get the big picture. I know you do. I, I know you have, and I, I, I know you will. Number two. Second lesson I wish that I could have learned at your age is to make every day your masterpiece. Just every day. Just not only grow every day, but take every day and realize it's the only day you have. John Wooden, the great coach at UCLA, was a mentor of mine, and he's the one that taught me make every day your masterpiece. And let me just share with you, without any doubt, the secret of your success and the secret of my success is determined by our daily behavior. In other words, if I could, if I could spend one day with any of you, just, just spend a day and all I would do is hang. I don't need to lead you. I, I just need to hang with you. If I, could, if I could just hang with you for one day, Probably at the end of that day, I could give you a pretty good prognosis of, 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 of the potential of your success. Because you see, in, in that day, I'm going to find out what kind of an attitude you have. It's going to show up. It's going to show up. It doesn't take long. I, I'm going to find in that day how you prioritize your life. In that day, I'm going to, I'm going to find out how you, how you think. I, I'm, in that day, I'm going to find out how you connect with people, if you're good with relationships. In that day, I'm going to find out how disciplined you are. You, you see, I mean, it's, you, you don't have to wait a long time to figure your potential out. It, it, it's discovered in a day. I wrote a book called Today Matters, and PC says that's, his favorite book. He said that's the book that he kind of formed his development as, as a leader. And, and, and the reason it, it, it's such a, a good book is it's, it's, it's so manageable. I mean, if all I ask you to do is, could you make today your masterpiece? Could you today just kind of make today count? Every one of you just sign up and say, yeah, I, I, that's 24 hours. I can do that. See, our issue is so many times we're thinking, tomorrow and we're thinking about the big picture and we're thinking about life and it gets a little overwhelming and we're not really sure that we can get there you don't don't get overwhelmed just one day at a time and, and don't 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 lose today looking for tomorrow the tendency again with youth is to is to dream and keep the dream i want that for you and, and it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's to say you know well you know, someday and, 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 you know, one of these days. And what I've learned a long time ago is, 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 is one of these days usually becomes none of these days. You, you, you don't need to, to go there. You need to stay here. You need to be in the present. You need to be, to be right where you are right now. Wow. You know, Joshua understood that today mattered. He said, choose you today whom you will serve. Esther understood that, for she came into the kingdom for such a time as this. The psalmist, he understood. He said, this is the day the Lord has made. And in fact, Jesus, in the great sermon he did at Matthew chapter 6, what did he say? Give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. I have discovered that if I give my entire attention to what God is doing right now, He'll prepare all the things I need for tomorrow. 
I, I don't need to be God. I don't need to wait, be out there. And, you know, people all the time are saying, well, what do you think for the next five years? And I'm saying, you know, I just kind of wish people would think for today. I'm not asking for too much. I mean, hey, I don't know. You, tomorrow is not guaranteed. But, but today, just make every day your masterpiece. And, and it's, it's, got to be, it's got to be your best because to be a steward of your gifts is not to deny the best work in your gifts tomorrow, but it's, it's to cultivate them today. You see, every day I'm either preparing or repairing. And you're in a preparing stage, and I'm so excited for you because you have the climate and the environment and the people around you that, that really set you off. I mean, we hear this statement all the time, all is well that, be, that ends well, but I want to tell you all is well that begins well. And, and, and this is now, and this is the beginning, and, and now is the only time you have. So, so just seize the moment and, and just, just stay right there. I wish you could sit where I'm sitting. I wish you could look at you. You look so beautiful. You're so responsive. You're leaning in. You're hanging on every word. You're taking notes. I I wish you could see you. If you could see you, you'd be real happy. You'd be real happy. But you can't see you, but I can see you. So you're making me happy. You're making me very fulfilled that you, Chris, we have to put in our relationship contract that I get to do this every year. I, I just have to. I just, you know, I just have to do it. I just have to do it. I love little Chris. Chris kills me. He's so beautiful. He is. He's so precious. By the way, you, you do understand how blessed you are to have Chris and Mark and the people here. You, you do understand that there are millions of students who will never have what you have and never receive what you receive. Look at the person you're sitting beside and say to them, we are the lucky ones. Number three. The third lesson I wish I had learned in college was that um, good leadership doesn't make everyone happy. Um, this was a huge miss in my life in my early years. Perhaps if you understand the context of what I grew up in, I grew up in a very small holiness denomination, good people, very good people, but um, not progressive, you know, not not fulfilling the Great Commission. I mean, their, their, their theme song wasn't Onward Christian Soldiers. It was kind of like Hold the Fort. <laughs> their idea of progress was moving backwards slowly. <laughs> and the big thing when I grew up, the big thing, was that when you became a pastor, because we were congregational, which means the congregation literally voted on you each year to see if you would continue to pastor that church. The big thing when I grew up wasn't be a great leader, wasn't change lives, it wasn't make a difference in people's lives. It was please everybody and get a unanimous vote. And so when Margaret and I went to our first little country church in southern Indiana, by the way, the first Sunday we only had three, and two of them were Margaret and me. <laughs> Literally. Yeah. And there was an old lady named Maud right beside the church, and she came that first day. So it was Maud, Margaret, and me. <laughs> and so we kind of grew, and by the first year, we had maybe, I don't know, 35, 40 members, not many, but, but, the, but they did their vote. And I still remember the vote. Still remember the vote. 
31 yes, one no, one abstained. And I called my dad on the phone very serious, went straight home, got on the phone as quick as I could. And I asked dad, I said, dad, should, should I stay another year? Well, he said, what was the vote, son? I said, 31 yes, one no, one abstained. And he started laughing. He said, oh, he said, you should stay. He said, I know you, son. He said, it's the best vote you'll ever get. For six months, every Sunday I'd go to church and I'd ask the question, who was the one vote? And to be honest, I was asking who are the two votes? Because if you abstain, honestly. <laughs> you're not real excited about what's happening. <laughs> if you can't put your yes down. And, 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 and I just, um, I just wish that somebody would have come and sat beside me and said, uh, le leadership isn't making everybody happy. It took me a while to understand that God had called me to be a leader, not a clown. I remember when I, now, it took me, this is ridiculous, it took me about four years to get through this. Took me about four years to, to quit trying to please every person and make every person happy. And when I wrote the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, I remember speaking one day on it and I was signing the book and a man came and he handed me the book. And so as I'm, I'm, I'm signing it, he said, well, he said, I disagree with one of your laws. And I'm signing the book and I said, that's okay. Just hand it back to him. He just, he doesn't move. He, he said, I don't think you heard me. I disagree with one of your laws. I said, I got it. It's okay. It's okay. And, and then I realized it, it was okay with me, but it wasn't okay with him that it was okay with me. So he tried it again. And that's when I looked at him and said, I'm, I'm so sorry. I said, I, I didn't write the book to make you happy. I, I wrote the book to help you. But I wish when I wish when I wish when I was in college. I wish when I was in my first church that, that I could have known that. I really do. You know, with social media and, and the great desire to make sure people like you. By the way, I I, I was doing social media in the third grade. I, I was. I I was ahead of my time. I, I was in the third grade, and I looked over to my right, and Tammy Hostenberg was sat right beside me, and she was the prettiest girl in the class. And I wrote her a note. Tammy, I like you. Do you like me? One box, yes. One box, no. <laughs> she said no. <laughs> and that got me over the hump of wanting everybody to like me. By the way, it's been now proven that if you have good values on the inside, you need less validation on the outside. But when you don't have that strength and those good core values on the inside, then all of a sudden what other people say is so important to you. But I wish when I was in college, I just wish when I was young, I, I would have understood that the goal of leadership isn't to make everybody happy or please everybody. The goal of leadership is to do what is right. Now, that doesn't give us permission to be nasty or to have personality conflicts, but it, but it does give us permission to, to lead with clarity and with vision and not with opinions. And number four, boy, you're doing so good. What an honor to be here with you today. 
I spoke to 10,000 businessmen in Milan, Italy, and I spoke to the last night in San Jose, Costa Rica, I spoke to about 10,000 people. And today I'm here. I spoke to a whole bunch of business people yesterday at the church. Chris, you're right. This is my highlight right here. This, this, this is it right here. I'm going to have my tanks of fuel when I'm done with you. I won't need a plane to go to Hawaii. <laughs> They'll say, who is that old man running down there so fast? <laughs> Lesson number four. Man, do I wish I would have known this. Lesson number four, a significant life can be achieved early in life. You see, when I, when I was young, when I was your age, and I dreamed like you dreamed, I understand it completely. I would say to myself continually, you know, someday I'm going to be successful and maybe I'll do something significant for God. Or, or someday, you know, someday maybe I'll financially be able to really give a lot to the kingdom of God. And, and, I, and I, put, I put significance and, and I put someday together. And, and when I put significance in some way together, I eliminated today. And I just wish somebody in chapel would have looked at me at 20 and said, hey, you can... You can be significant in your life today. Now, let me make sure we understand what significance is. Success, success when we think about that, that's about us, okay? And it's our calling and our career and, you know, our church and our place of ministry. But it, it's, it's pretty much about us. Su success is, and the difference between success and significance is, is success is pretty much about me, but significance is about others. So the intent is totally different. It's in, I either wake up today and say, how do I make my life better? Or I wake up today and ask, how do I make the lives of others better? I either wake up today and say, I hope somebody helps me. Or I wake up today and say, I hope I can help others. And so th they're different. And, 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 and success, too, uh, too much success. It, it's possible in success to get very selfish, to get very greedy. And, and I've known a lot of successful people that are unhappy, a lot of successful people. that are, they got a lot of stuff, but they're unhappy. But every significant person I've ever met is always happy and fulfilled because we were created to serve others. We were created to add value to others. And, and, and selfishness and, and significance, they're just not compatible. They, they're, 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 you just, if you're selfish, you're not going to be significant. And if you really live significance, it'll squeeze the selfishness out of you. It, it just works that way. I was speaking the other day, and somebody came up to me, and they just said, that. I just couldn't believe it, but they, they looked at me and said, well, thank God I'm not a selfish person. And I just looked at him, and I thought, really? I wanted to say I didn't. I want to say you're also not self-aware. <laughs> we all have. All of us have selfishness within us. We, we were born in selfishness. I mean, think of a little child. You know, what's yours is mine. You know, I mean, we, 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 we've got that selfish part in us. And so, so if you don't think you're selfish, just let me ask you a question. When somebody, you know, you're with your friends and somebody takes a picture of you, when you look at that picture, let me ask you a question. I see the train a coming. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you a question. Who's the first person you look for in that picture? And so, I mean, you just go through. I mean, oh, there I am. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. It, 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 if it's... If, if it's not good, you say, oh, 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 no, no, oh, no, do it again, do it again. Let's, do, let's take another one. Come on, one more time. Come on. Yeah. 
Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You, all you saw was you. Oh, oh, do it again. And, and if you like it really, oh, great picture, great picture. Great. Send it to me. Send it. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So you say, how do I end college when I haven't really gotten started in my calling and I'm just a kid and I don't have any experience and don't have any possessions. I mean, how do I, how do I right now live a significant life? I'm going to give you the answer. It's very simple. Every day, add value to people. Start now with the habit of adding value to people every day. The way it works in my life is very simple, and you can do this. There are five things I do every day. I mean, I do them today at 74, but I did them at 54, and I, I, I did them at 34. I didn't do them at 24 because I didn't know. But I do them now. Been doing them for years. Every day. Every day, number one, I value people. Your greatest ministry will be fulfilled if you value every person. So every day I value people. Every day. I think of ways to add value to people. So before I'm with them, I've already thought about them, and how can I add value to them? I did a podcast with PC this morning, and, and before I got into the room, I'm thinking about him, and how can I add value to him in this incredible podcast that's beginning to influence tens and hundreds of thousands of people? How, how can I, when I thought about you, I, how could, what can I do today in chapel to, to add value to oh, On the front end, Think of ways that you can add value to people so that when you're there, you already have some thoughts going that this is what I'm going to do to serve them and add value to them. So value people. Every day, value people. Every day, think of ways to add value to people. Number three, every day, look for ways to add value to people. Look for ways. Now you're with them. Now you're with them. And by the way, if you look for ways to add value to people, you'll find ways to add value to people. But if you don't look for ways to add value to people, you'll find no way to add value to them. You see, you don't see things as they are. You see things as you are. That's why two people can be in the same room. And one person's adding value to everybody, and the other person's sitting in the corner. Same room, same environment, same opportunity. Remember this. Same is no longer same when you're intentional. When you become intentional, you separate yourself from everyone else. Because most life people, they don't lead their life, they accept their life. So every day, I value people. Think of ways to add value people. Look for ways to add value people. Number four, every day I do things that add value to people. Every day I do things. It's in the do. It's good intentions is a phrase that is overrated. No one has ever had their life changed by good intentions. No act has ever been done by good intentions. Good intentions need to become good actions. That's why intentionality is so essential. We've got to go from what I would like to do to what I actually did. There's a big difference. And finally, every day I encourage others to add value to people. That's what I'm doing right now in, in the chapel service. I'm just doing my best to just encourage you to, to add value to people. Okay, one more. I will admit I saved this one to last. Not because it's maybe more important than the other four. I, I saved it to last because this one, um, it's spiritual. And your Christian kids on a Christian journey to make an incredible difference in, in the world of faith. 
So I'll give you this one. I, I wish when I was your age I, I would have known this. I didn't, but I wish I would have. Number five, an effective prayer life requires listening more than asking. If you really want to have an intimate prayer relationship with the Father, you've got to do less asking and you've got to do more listening. Now, the reason I wish I would have known that is because I developed the discipline of prayer in college. In fact, my freshman year, my first resolve as a college freshman was to be a person of prayer. So every day in the cafeteria from noon to 1 o'clock, we had lunch. At about 1.05, I would leave all my friends in the cafeteria, and I'd walk to the back part of the campus, away from all the dormitories, and clear way, way in the back of the campus, there was a, a block shed, just, I don't know, a, I'd say maybe 12 by 15, just a small block shed. And, and, and I, would, I would go in there, and there was just a bench to sit on, and that became my prayer place. And every day, I spent an hour in prayer, every day. One to two o'clock. Because I've, I truly believe that I would have to be a, a man of prayer to, to be a great spiritual leader. And so prayer growth has been something that's always been very essential and important to me. But I'm going to talk to you about listening instead of asking. I don't think asking is wrong, by the way, so don't, 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 don't go either or. I'm talking about ratio here. I do a lot more. I'm, I'm, I'm 85% listening and I'm 15% asking. But when I was this kid going to the prayer room in the back of the campus, I was 100% asking. I wasn't into listening. I mean, it wasn't like I would refuse to listen to God. It's just that I had so much stuff that he needed to know about. There's a difference between immaturity and maturity. Immature people, they see things only from their perspective. That's why they're immature. It's just that simple. And mature people, they see things from the perspective of others. And it took me until I was in, really, this is a little disappointing to tell you, but it took me until I was in my 50s to understand that I was an immature prayer person. That most of my prayer was based around my perspective. And all of a sudden, well, I'll tell you what, it was, it was what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 9, that just one day, just I had just happened to be reading, because Matthew 6 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and, and it's the passage that says, your father knows better than you what you need. Isn't that simple? Your father knows better than you what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply. Your will be done. And all of a sudden it hit me that I was acting as if God didn't know my needs as much as I knew my needs. And all of a sudden it just hit me that I was kind of making sure God was aware, like, like, like he was up in heaven and I'm praying to him and I'm saying things to him and he said, oh, wait, oh my gosh, John, hold it. I had no idea. <laughs> Wait, wait, go slower. Wow, thank you. I, I had missed that one. Oh, my gosh. Here, I, do it slowly. I got to make sure I catch everything. <laughs> and I read this first. And I said to myself, you're very immature in your prayer relationship with God. And then I looked at Samuel I don't have time to teach this today, but in, in the five levels of leadership biblically, Samuel was a level five leader. I mean, he was at the very top in leadership. And, and, and when he was a little child, remember when, 
when, when God was speaking to him and he was, you know, going to the priest, Eli, and this whole process, and, you know, what was he instructed to do? Just say, you know, speak, Lord, I, I'm listening. And I thought, no wonder he was a level five leader. As a kid, he was taught to say, you know, you speak, Lord, I'm listening. And what I've discovered is, you know, listening, it, 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 listening keeps me, it keeps me humble, it keeps me fresh, it, it keeps me dependent. It, it really creates a spirit of obedience. I'm reading from one of, uh, one of uh, the quotes of Agnes Stanford. She said, prayer is not a matter of getting what you want the most. Prayer is a matter of giving ourselves to God and learning his ways so he can do through us what he wants most. The psalmist said, you know, when I wait on you, God, you strengthen my heart. For so long, for too long, I was asking God, so not, not so much what his will was for my life, but I wanted his approval on my will for my life. And so... Um, I just wish I would have known that when I was your age. I, I do. I, um, I have a little simple expression. You'll catch this very quickly, and that is simplify to amplify. Listen to hear. And so I've made a practice of, of, of listening. And, and what that means is that every day I spend time with my legal pad and my four-color pen. And I say, okay, God, you, you talk to me. Just talk to me. You know, listening is wanting to hear. You've seen some people, they're quiet, and you're talking, but they're not listening. They're waiting for you to shut up, so they can talk. I don't mean that's wrong. They're, they're just being polite. But they're not wanting to hear. They're waiting to talk. And what I discovered is in my prayer time, I was wanting to talk more than I was wanting to hear. And so I purposely changed it. And my whole life and my prayer life began to take a... a total different dynamic. It was out of that setting that I, uh, it was out of that setting that I learned the beauty of obedience. Most Christians are educated way beyond the level of their obedience. They already know more than they do. And obedience Obedience is not understood on the front end. It's understood on the back end. That's why trust is essential on the front end. We trust him because we don't understand him. God is too good to be unkind and he's too wise to be confused. And if I cannot trace his hand, I can always trust his heart. God is too good to be unkind. He's too wise to be confused. If I cannot trace his hand, in other words, if I cannot see his works, I can always trust his heart. Listening is only created in a trusting environment. And I've learned to trust him. And many of the things that on the front end I don't understand, they, they do not disturb me at all. I don't have any desire to ask questions. But I do have a desire to hear him. Just hear him. And to hear him is enough.
And once I hear him, I just start walking. And what I'm discovering is that the things I don't understand when I start walking are understood while I walk. God can't steer a parked car. But listening starts me moving. And what I'm discovering is that there's a beautiful thing about walking in the rhythm of God. It's my favorite time. And if you would stop me during the walk and say, do you understand? I would say, no. And you would say, well, why are you walking? Because I don't need to understand. I just need to trust and obey. PC is not only a beautiful friend, but he's been on our equip board for since the beginning, really. And he and I have traveled the world together, and we've just had incredible spiritual experiences with that organization. But after we trained five million leaders in every country of the world, I knew in my heart that God wanted me to take leadership to transformational level. And I could, just, just give me a couple more minutes. I knew what he wanted, but I couldn't describe it to anyone else. They would ask me and say, well, John, what do you mean by a transformational leader? And, you know, a leader wants to give answers. And it's not fun to have a vision and not be able to explain it. But I just knew that was his heart. And so we began to pick our way through the process. And when you do this journey, you, you learn a lot and you make a lot of mistakes, but, but can I tell you, my failures, my, my, my misses, or my, my, my falls, they don't discourage me because I've heard from him. And my successes, they don't puff me up and make me proud because I heard from him. I heard from him. And that's all I need. That he knows. I don't mean it unkindly. I don't mean it arrogantly. You can come and help me and give me advice. And I'll appreciate it and I'll value it. But I feel like Nehemiah when he was building the wall. And he had all the distractors down there that were trying to get him to focus on. And he said, I'm building a wall and I cannot come down. And I want to tell people, I've heard from God. I can't come down. I can't be distracted. Just walk one step at a time. And on the back end, you understand. I was just in Costa Rica, and I spent an hour illustrating, defining, and giving examples of transformation. And people were just taking notes and on their feet and plotting and wanting it to happen in their country. And I thought, I'm talking an hour on I even have motions to explain transformation and, and examples and pictures and, and I'm doing all this and I'm saying, isn't this amazing? And nine years ago, I couldn't even tell a person what it was. If you'll listen, trust, and obey, you will develop a God consciousness in your life 
that the world cannot touch. It cannot even come close to competing with it. There are so many times anymore in my life, and perhaps it's because I'm on the back end, I don't know, that I hear voices around me, and I appreciate them, and I value them. But I long. I, I hunger. I hunger to hear one voice. And that voice is enough. I don't need anyone else to validate. I don't need anyone else to compliment. I don't need anyone else to add. I just need him. My time is up. Did, did somebody cheat me with the time? Okay. I, I'll be done, but I'm not done. I'm coming back again. Can I just have a moment to pray with you? Is it okay? Just to... Oh, Father, you see that? You see that? Special, precious, called. PC is so right. We have no idea how this world is going to be changed by these world changers. But we do know this. It's going to become a better world because these precious kids love you with their heart, their mind, their soul, and their strength. And they're all in. So I pray over them. I ask for you to do for them what they could not do for themselves. Give them a hunger to listen and a trust to obey. And during their Christmas time when they're relaxing and being with people that they love and having a changed agenda, everything that they need to be coming back refreshed during this time, let them practice listening and put some seed, seed thoughts into their heart and seed touches into their heart. And when they come back, may they come back on a little higher level spiritually than they've ever been before. I am so excited God's answering this prayer right now. He's answering the prayer right in this room. For some of you, he is directly answering this prayer. So glory, glory to the Father. Glory, glory to the Son. Glory, glory to the Spirit. Glory to the three of one. Amen. I love you.